Okay. So, uh, <laughs> uh, will this be taking my soul? Like Shari is throwing down the hay. We go about ten seconds. All right. Nine, and eight, we're live. Seven, and six, we're live. Five. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for coming to uh, the great failure of the hacker halfway house. That's yeah. not the name. Of the <laughs> <Woo! Yeah. laughs> The name of this talk is Building Communities in Self-Destructive Environments. While He's the hacker not bitter, really. <laughs> I'm not. For the record, the reason I put that up is because apparently this talk, before anybody even knew what it was really going to be about, has caused lots of drama. Uh, people have been going up to residents of the Hacker Halfway House saying, Hey, Jen, have you heard that Seth is giving a talk on how the Hacker Halfway House failed? And she was like, meh. <laughs> and it's not what the talk like, was about. you, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I hate these guys from Triple H. Yeah, I, I hate you guys. I don't understand why you're here. because you got kicked out. Yeah, I guess, oh, I guess that's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just bitter because I'm still paying electricity bills. <laughs> <laughs> Only because we didn't pay them back in the day. <laughs> so, building communities in self-destructive environments, and because of all of that drama, I'm going to start with telling you what this talk is not. Alcohol. This talk is not about how the hacker halfway house failed. Uh, that would be a good talk. Like, I don't thank think. Thank you for a slide. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that one. Um, despite photographic evidence and <laughs> rumor, um, the hacker halfway house hasn't actually failed. So yet. let's just yet. <laughs> let's let's just get that out there first. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Hacker Halfway House is a loft apartment in Brooklyn where I used to live and some of these losers up in the front row live now. It's a hacker space. It's a hacker space. <laughs> it was featured in a panel at the Fifth Hope, kind of. And there was um, a wicked ass party afterwards. Yes, and there was a wicked ass party, I mean, wicked ass, ass party, party afterwards. <laughs> so this talk is not about how the Hacker Halfway House failed, even though there are probably going to be many jokes about that. It's also not about how fucking ShmooCon fucking sucks. I have nothing against ShmooCon. <laughs> Believe it or not. Flip flop, flip flop. <laughs> this is not a personal attack on anybody involved. <laughs> so, I have nothing against them, but for some reason everybody else likes exaggerating these things, and I've been asked, isn't it kind of ballsy to be given a talk about that? And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So, <laughs> this talk is not about I hate ShmooCon, I hate people at ShmooCon, I hate the con, because I don't. So, that's not what this is about. This talk is not a lecture to all of you con goers about don't be an immature shitbag. Um, <laughs> it needs. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. <laughs> But seriously, guys, like, it's relevant. I'm not going to lecture you about it, but don't be that guy. <laughs> On a similar note... <laughs> <laughs> Who here was at Rubicon 5? <laughs> Who, who here, any, was anybody else here at Rubicon 5? Does anybody, who here gets this reference? Okay, so like just us and two other people, okay. There's a lot of people here that just not your talk. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the joke behind this is that a few... <laughs> Jokes are best, are yeah. when explained. Uh, <laughs> a few years back, Jason Scott gave a keynote, which effectively was, don't destroy the hotel, thank you. And 
there was a pretty nasty flame war that happened afterwards, and to this day there is still some animosity, not with me, but with other parties <coughs> involved. Um, so this talk is not about if you focus your energy like a laser, you can do anything. So just about paraphrase, but yes. So what this talk is, it's observations about communities. Um, I've been involved in a number of group projects, some of them pretty small, some of them pretty big, and had to deal with a whole lot of the not-so-fun parts of dealing with people, uh, whether it is an actual living arrangement, like the Hacker Halfway House was, or something that's completely online, like some of my other projects. So I've dealt a lot with this, and people will ask, you know, if I'm trying to do a project like this, what do I do? How did you get so big? How did this start? So this can be a way of, you know, if anybody is thinking of doing something or is stuck in it right now, how to find new, pro uh, new methods for solving the common problems that come up and helping you guys or anybody else avoid common mistakes that are very frequently made in the initial stages of these things, not out of stupidity or ignorance or anything like that, just because it, it seems like a good idea at the time, and later on you realize, why the hell did I do that? So hopefully this will give some insight into those situations. And it's also asking the question that needs to be asked, why do people shit where they eat? Um, in this case, you know, like if we go back, <laughs> yeah, if we go back a couple of slides, I mean, things have been good here so far, but if you stick an NVIDIA sticker on the hotel property, the hotel staff isn't going to be like, huh, I wonder who did that. <laughs> we, we have no idea who might have stuck this NVIDIA sticker from this convention on this elevator wall. Viral marketing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it is. You never know. But it just it raises the question, why do people make things more difficult for something that they ultimately hope to benefit from? So. The first community <laughs> that I'm going to talk about, <laughs> let's like start, start, <laughs> we're going to start at the bottom of the barrel here, uh, no, IRC. So I am one of the admins for the 2600 IRC network. Um, I've been for a few years now, I've got a bunch of other people involved, and this is one of those projects that... Uh, d who here goes on 2600 net? Can I get a I show of hands? Okay. So, all the uh, familiar people. So, a little history. What? Yeah. So, here's a little timeline of how 2600 net has operated. A number of years ago, it was basically anarchy. Uh, there were administrators and you know, stories of the administrators taking down servers with baseball bats and nobody fixing anything. And no, no, no. Someone broke in and fixed a lot of stuff. Yeah, SJ. <laughs> uh, when, when, when there were a bunch of botnet floods, uh, one of my friends, he uh, broke into all of the IRC servers and put up some anti-flood bots and then patched all the servers just so that we could actually use the IRC network. He compromised, rooted all of the 2600 servers. Um, uh, so it was completely unmaintained. Um, and then people got upset at this, and they decided to fight back against the poor maintenance of the network by DDoSing the shit out of it. And as a result, <laughs> as a result, it was down for about a year and a half to two years. Um, while there was restructuring, reorganization, trying to find people who were actually willing to put up a machine that they knew was just going to be DDoSed. Um, it came back up with some people who weren't generally involved in the project, and then uh, Ted stole our passwords. The guy who ran services wasn't doing his job, and we delinked his services, and people turned the fact that he kept the password database into this huge drama that is still brought up to this day because, oh no, he has our encrypted passwords. He might try to log into our bank accounts. This is criminal negligence on your part. We're going to sue you. What? Uh, so 
there was that, and now today we have an IRC network. It's got five or six leafs. Uh, it works. It's not perfect, but it's reasonably, it works. Um, that's about the best you can get from IRC, uh, just because of the, the way it's designed. What's a CCNA? I'm going to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the problems that we've had here, and <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, some of the historical problems with 2600 net, and again, please, for anybody watching this later on, you know, Emmanuel, uh, <laughs> don't take this as a personal attack, but this is just an observation and ways of trying to make things better by saying don't do these things. Yeah. Uh, first of all, if you have people who are in a project who are the only point of contact for any sort of resource, they can't be absent from the project. Period. If somebody is not putting in the duties that they have to do in order to maintain some sort of service, boot them. It doesn't matter how good they are at what they do. It doesn't matter what level of resources they can offer. If they're not doing their job, get them off the project. Period. Um, trying to fight these people to get them to do anything from the standpoint of another administrator is hell. And when their reason for not doing anything is I hate these assholes. Why should I do anything for them? That's a sign right there that they should no longer be involved in the project. Get them off. Uh, next point, overwhelming bureaucracy. Uh, if you have to deal with these people and you have to do things like make unanimous decisions about trivial policies, then you've run into another problem. Uh, voting on things is good. Having democratic rule, yeah, not bad. Assuming everybody knows what they're doing, has a clue, and actually wants to be doing it. Otherwise, democratic procedure doesn't work, uh, is worse than not working sometimes, and it sucks. It sucks to deal with, and it drives people who actually want to be involved away from the project. Same is true of government. Yeah, it's, it's true, but at least on IRC you can make a difference. Kind of. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> so, <laughs> next issue, decentralized command structure. Uh, there was a lot of lack of communication between the people running the project. So somebody would launch an attack against the network, and I would G-line them off the network. And then this person would send a manual an email saying, oh, well, this shardy guy is a real dick, and he just g-lined me for no reason because I was just trying to chat. I was trying to chat on the IRC. And then immediately the ban would be lifted, and the guy would come back and start doing the same things again. And it would go back and forth. People would take, you know, if dad says you can't do something, then go to mom and ask her. Uh, it's same policy, and... <laughs> yeah, you know, all of those illegitimate children. Illegitimate yeah, all those illegitimate children I have, thanks to Wikipedia. Well, see, I learned how to use birth control on Wikipedia. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think there might have been a problem there. All right, and then the freedom of speech issues. This is a uh, a recent problem on 2600 Net, and what happened was people equate 2600 with freedom of speech. And then, they, OK, yeah, that's reasonable. And then they take that one step further and say, freedom of speech means the ability to say whatever I want, wherever I want, fuck you, go away. So unfortunately, people started using extremely hateful slang in IRC to the point of where, so yeah, dropping the N-bomb, um, <laughs> to the point of where people were Entire sentences were constructed. Yes. <laughs> yes. Whole sentences in but most people were joking around because they thought it was a non issue. But what they didn't realize is that I was getting emails off of the network, off of the lists, saying, I can't believe you of all people is racist. Like, I, can, I cannot believe that you're racist. I can't believe that you support this activity. I can't believe that you let it happen. Fuck you. And I'm kind of uncomfortable with that. Uh, you know, it's, it's the internet, so I shouldn't take it seriously, blah, blah, blah. But when somebody is going around telling people that you 
are racist because you're allowing people to openly talk about how much they hate niggers, that's not okay. And we stepped in to try to do something about it. And the way the different administrators handled the subject, it was not very coordinated. And one of my friends stepped forward and just started doing word-based searches and removing everybody who used Ooh. offensive language. So another one of my friends decided that he would substitute CCNA for the words in question because <laughs> the person who was doing this draconian word ban was a CCNA. He didn't notice for about a month. He wondered why <laughs> the racism stopped and everybody was talking about Cisco certifications all of a sudden. <laughs> and it was great. And a month later, he figured it out. And <laughs> yeah, so the difference, the reason I'm bringing this up is because the difference of how people handle things, uh, if there's no communication, things can get bad. And then when there's infighting among the people who are setting these policies, it can get even worse. Um, in this case, it actually did solve the problem. But this, the people I don't know, I've never met, have been coming up to me and saying, what up, my CCNA? And I'm like, how the hell did you learn that? <laughs> so th this, is, like, th this is not even people on IRC. These are people who have, like, don't touch computers at all, and they're saying that. And it's like, where the hell did you learn that from? <laughs> so these things can kind of cause lasting effects if you uh, aren't careful. CCNA, please. <laughs> <laughs> Another problem, uh, I ran a server, its name was Ptolemaea. It's true. Um, so I had this server that I was running. It was linked up to 2600 net. Um, it was on our SDSL at the Hacker Halfway House. And because of the involvement with 2600 net and because of my name being attached to it, they targeted my personal servers as well as the 2600 net IRC servers. And we got hit by a SIN flood, good old standard SIN flood. Uh, the ISP we were using was either incompetent or just didn't care about us. Um, so they refused to do any filtering on their end. And then the next thing we know, we're hearing from our friend who had a buddy in the ISP uh, saying that we were getting hit by 20 megabits of SIN flood tra traffic, which is a lot for the one megabit or so that we had at the time. It also caused a 50% packet loss across the entire ISP from what we heard. People really didn't like us. And they were directing that at me. They, they really didn't like me a lot of the times. And then Miles stepped forward, and they didn't like Miles, and I was OK. But the <laughs> question is, why, why would somebody do this? Like, there, there was no, no, nobody was really offended, um, or they shouldn't have been offended. I mean, arguing on the internet. Everybody knows, arguing on the internet. Uh, why would somebody launch an attack, 20 megabits of traffic for quite an extended period of time against this insignificant IRC server? And the answer, paraphrased, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was not, not word for word, I think. Uh, the actual answer he gave was a little less legible. Um, I, so the basic response was, your services are insecure because I can knock them offline. You don't believe me, so I'm just going to knock you offline. And there's really nothing you can do f to, to block this kind of attack unless you sink millions and millions of dollars into these DDoS mitigation boxes or get a colo that actually cares about you and has reasonable bandwidth. Not that much money, but it takes a significant more amount of money and time and energy and effort and caring than we all had. And so we said, yeah, we know we can't block against this because it's a project run by volunteers. We're paying for the equipment. We're paying for the bandwidth. What do you want us to do? And they didn't offer any constructive advice. They just said, I'm just going to keep DDoSing you because I can. So what to do in this situation? Uh, organizational structure needs to be clear from the beginning. Uh, you need to acknowledge your technological limitations. And in this case, the DDoS attacks, there's nothing you can do about them. And you have to be upfront about this. And if somebody insists on 
proving this to you, even though it's something you already know, you need to take other measures to stop it, whether those are talking to the ISP, talking to law enforcement, uh, some sort of non-technological solution needs to fix this problem. Um, and being the point man for these kinds of problems, this isn't the job of a network admin. It's not the job of somebody who is a computer security expert. It's the job of a politician. It's, you need to be careful what you say. You need to be careful of what you do because it's not a technical problem. And a lot of people don't realize this. Uh, these things, you can't just throw more money or technology or whatever at it. You have to make reasonable decisions based on how the other person is going to act. And you might not like it, but it's the only way for it to work. So that's it for 2600 net for now. Uh, are there any questions about that before I continue on? No? OK, good. Uh, Hacker Halfway House. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, recognize anybody in that photo. Um, I don't know how well you can see it from here, but that's a picture from one of the more recent parties that was thrown there. It looks clean. Ish. Ish. It looks clean. <laughs> so here's the short, short history of the Hacker Halfway House. <laughs> so some people got a loft in Brooklyn. Uh, in Brooklyn, they all, for the most part, used computers. Uh, they did stuff on computers. They went on IRC a lot. Uh, they threw a bunch of parties. Uh, a lot of people showed up to the parties. A lot of people at these parties caused problems. Uh, some of the parties stopped. And then the place became a great big failure. I mean, <laughs> everything still exists as it was. The, there are people living there. It is, it's an actual living space. Uh, I found this out at the uh, Hacker Spaces panel at Fifth Hope. One thing I didn't realize is that these other people who've started these hacker spaces don't live there. They, they got it right. <laughs> they got it right from the beginning. Don't live where you throw the parties, because bad shit will happen. And I think we didn't realize this. I mean, we knew some stuff would happen. I mean, can I get some input here? Uh, My a concept when I first started throwing parties was uh, I could just advertise this on Craigslist in New York, because it doesn't matter who comes. Because I already live with Lucas, and it can't get worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> that works. <laughs> but the, the parties were. <laughs> we were like, we don't care about possessions, man. It doesn't matter. <laughs> we, we threw these parties after the 2600 meetings, so we'd get a lot of people. And then we'd be going in the subway back to the place, and some people on the subway platform would hear talk about a party, and they'd just lump onto the group. and. The group would get bigger and bigger as we made from the meeting to uh, Triple H. And then random people from the neighborhood started showing up. Um, at one point, uh, somebody uh, put out a post on full disclosure saying, so I'm going to New York to visit, and I was thinking about staying at the Hacker Halfway House. Does anybody know what it's like staying there? And I was just like, no, I, I live here. We're not a hostel. <laughs> Despite the name of the halfway house, you know, we're, we're not a halfway house. It's a name. Leave us alone. We were in the Wikipedia article. Yeah. The main 2600 Wikipedia article said, yeah. uh, blah, 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 2600 hertz, Captain Crunch, blah, 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 magazine, blah, 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 blah. Party at the HHH, yeah. first Friday of every month. Here's we, the address. We, we were, the, the Hacker Halfway House and the parties were mentioned in the Wikipedia article about 2600 before Kevin Mitnick was mentioned. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I understand that in real life. Like, I can definitely understand the reasonings for that, but it, it's not something you'd expect. We stayed up for over a year. Yeah. So, some of the problems that we had here with having all of these strangers and friends and supposed friends into our home. Um, people had really weird concepts of respect. Um, I would be standing there talking to some people, and somebody would be smoking a cigarette. And he'd finish with his cigarette, and he'd toss it on the floor, grind it out with his foot, have another sip of his drink, light up another cigarette. And I'm just like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> and he looks at me, and he's like, what? Gangsta. What? And I'm like, there's an ashtray right there. <laughs> he's like, oh, oh, I didn't realize I wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> And 
you know, who here would do that? And nobody's going to admit it, but would you drop your cigarette on somebody's living room floor and then grind it out in front of them and then get offended when they asked you why you're doing that? <laughs> all the time, all the time, yeah. <laughs> so there were, some, there were some fundamental respect issues from the very beginning with this whole thing. How much time do I have left? So more respect issues. People stole stuff. Who'd have thunk it, you know? People brought their laptops over, left their laptop out, and then went to pick it up at, you know, 7 o'clock two days later when they were leaving from the party, and it was gone. And this is the actual stolen laptop. Yeah, he was lucky. He actually got one of his back. Other people were not so lucky. There were a number of laptop, uh, laptops stolen. Uh, there was other random bits. Yeah, backpacks, other random stuff here and there. Uh, people would just see stuff available, grab it, and, you know, hey, free stuff. And we were kind of, or I was kind of surprised at the very least, because usually when you go into somebody's home and drink for free and, you know, stay for much longer than you're welcome there, you uh, <laughs> have at least a shred of respect of don't take their stuff or don't take other guests' stuff. But no, apparently that's not the case. The other problem was vandalism. So um, I don't know if he's here, but the guy with the OmniScan stickers, why, I forget his name even. I don't even know who, which one it is. Yeah, that's what I thought. He was on the radio just a little while ago. He's got these OmniScan stickers, and he puts them on everything. It's his trademark. And this is fine until you're finding them on things that really shouldn't have stickers on them. Like your underwear. Like your underwear or <laughs> your CDs or stuff like that. And Close every inside your wardrobe. Yeah, and you, you find them, and you, you scrape them off, and then next month he comes back and stickers everything up again. <laughs> And you say, please don't do that. And he's like, OK, I'm sorry, man. I won't. And then you walk away. And he's like, <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? You know? <laughs> you know, also, writing on the walls in Sharpie, that's OK, because it's a rundown building in Brooklyn, right? So like, you guys are going to repaint anyways, right? So I can just write on the wall in Sharpie. You know, it's no problem to write, Shardy is a whore on the front door of your building in a Sharpie. <laughs> he won't mind. No, the neighbors <laughs> won't think anything about it. It's all right now. You know? It's true. <laughs> but it gets worse. Yeah. Uh, one of my friends drove down from New Hampshire, and she had bought a brand new car three weeks before. And somebody at one of these parties thought it would be a good idea to take a can of latex wall paint that was sitting in the hallway of our building and pour it down her windshield into her engine and did more than $5,000 of damage to her three-week-old car. And nobody knows who did it. Um, if I find out who, I will fucking break their legs unless they admit it to me and give me an explanation for why they did it, in which case I will just... Break their toes. No, I will just uh, help Sam work the appropriate legal paperwork along. I know. I don't really mean it. I'm a very nonviolent person. I just talk a lot of shit. Um, <sighs> but, yeah, so... <laughs> somebody... The, 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 the vandalism at the parties was not small-scale, random, drunken shit. It was mostly that, but some people did serious amounts of damage to people's property when there was no reason to do so. We're guessing the only reason that her car was targeted was because it was brand new and shiny. And we know that more than likely, 99% sure, it was somebody from our party because the can of paint used came from not too far outside of our apartment in the building. So nobody knows what happened, but somebody was doing some real serious damage. This is more than just stickers on walls. Ha, 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 you got omni-scanned. Um, this was real. Uh, another thing, and I'm not sure whether this is fully accurate or not, but it was suggested that somebody might have caused other vehicle damage to somebody's car. Um, the, the quote that was used was, uh, either his brake lines were cut or Brooklyn has indigenous metal-eating chipmunks, one or the other. Uh, I can't verify that, but it was something that was brought up, and given the time that it happened, I really wouldn't be surprised. So, Problems. Uh, the weird part is, these were our friends. Uh, these were the monthly 
New York City 2600 after parties where it was mostly people we knew, friends of friends, friends of friends of friends, but all people who had some direct tie to the community, whatever you want to call the community, whether it's 2600 or the New York City hacker scene or these people that like to drink in Brooklyn, uh, this, this was our group. And they were the ones causing the problems. We had a party at Fifth Hope. We had hundreds and hundreds of strangers come through over the course of the night. Uh, I would not be surprised if the number topped 1,000. We had a lot of people over the course of that night. There were no problems, none. Uh, there was not a single incident that I remember that I heard of. I specifically asked about it, and people said, we don't believe it, everything went smoothly. So these people who had never been to the area before, who were entering a complete stranger's house, who had no ties to these people, were more respectful than the people that we saw on a monthly basis. <laughs> yeah. So, it's kind of interesting. I don't know the reason for that. I'm open to thoughts of why that might be the case, but interesting observation. Sucks. What? New York sucks. New York sucks. There you go. <laughs> so, the solution uh, at the time, it was close the doors and the parties. Uh, that decision has been retracted twice and reinforced twice since then. Uh, nobody likes a solution, nobody wanted to do it, but we just couldn't think of something better to do. Uh, the parties became invite only. They, there are sometimes parties on non-2600 events, so maybe it's just everybody who's in 2600 is a scumbag. Don't know. Uh, <laughs> no way, no way. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a bitch move, but <coughs> can you blame me? Um, nobody liked this solution, and it's still you know just trying to figure out what's acceptable, what's not, where the line is, how much babysitting you have to do with people, and how much you can allow them into your home and offer them your hospitality without worrying that they're just going to take advantage of it and screw you for it. So th these are no longer my decisions because I moved out a while back. Uh, now I have to fight for couch space too, which kind of sucks, but at least I'm not responsible when the police get called, so I guess it works out. Uh, and there's no simple answer to this question. It's just keep tweaking it, keep trying to find the balance that works for the time and for the people involved and for the events you want to throw. Get a space you don't live in. Get a space you don't live in. Um, I live in the Hacker Halfway House. <laughs> sure. People still ask me, can I come over to the Hacker Halfway House? I'm like, okay. <laughs> you might want to ask somebody who lives there first, though. All right, next project. So I've got plenty of time. Yeah, another failure right here. <laughs> Oculate.net. Oh, organic. Organic? Yeah, it's organic. Okay, um, <laughs> apparently Oculate.net is now organic. Can I get a vote of confidence from the hippie? <laughs> All right, so <laughs> Oculate.net is a project I started six years ago. It wasn't even really a project at the time. I just I put up a shell account box, ran my own mail server, put up my own web page, and hosted something on a static IP and didn't have to go through somebody else for it. And Started it at home, no, no big deal. Uh, the first box that I had up for the server, uh, the case for the machine hadn't even arrived yet, so I had the motherboard sitting on a block of foam with the power supply sitting next to it and the drive sitting next to it. So it started off kind of sketchy, um, but <laughs> since then, gangsta, yeah. Uh, since then, it has got better and better as I've done things like get a job and have money to pay for things. Um, like a case. But I had the case, it was just in the process of being shipped. And then when I got it, I didn't want to turn the machine off, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, these days, it's, uh, I've got about 70 users on the system. Uh, the machine is now hosted in a co facility in Boston. Uh, a number of people, uh, a large quantity of people, more than I thought, using it as their primary email addresses and web space, and it's, all the basic internet services, you know, people mostly use it for uh, getting on IRC, 2600 net with a shell, 
uh, but they also use it for email and web hosting, secondary MX, secondary DNS, uh, network backup, file storage, all that good stuff. Um, and it's working out really well. Um, I pay for everything out of my own pocket because I'd be doing it for myself anyways, and I can afford it at this point, so it's not a big deal. Uh, it's interesting. It's a lot of time and a lot of work, but uh, it's, it's good. But as always, there are problems. Um, of course, I'm on the internet, so I've been hit by denial of service attacks. Uh, nothing as massive as the 20 megabit SIN flood, but sometimes I'll get DDoSed and I won't even know why. Somebody will just have picked my server out to hit for no apparent reason. Uh, you know, now I've got an ISP that is actually responsive, and if I ask them to filter things upstream, they do it. And the problems are considerably less because I'm putting money into it. A lot of people also try breaking into the system because uh, for one reason or another, people consider it high profile. Um, it's also partially due to 2600 net. A lot of people on 2600 net are coming from this server and pissing people off and getting DDoSed or trying to me. break in. Someone else. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Like I never pisses anybody off. Nope, never. Unlovable. Um, there's been some abuse of resources, but for the most part, not so much. It does happen, though. Uh, one of the biggest problems was initially before I had all of the money to float a new machine and a professional colo and all of that, hardware failure. You know, if a hard drive dies from being old or being in a place that has toner dust in the air and turns the cats black and makes you cough up nastiness for a year. Uh, hmm? Well, the cat was white. But, but Maybe that's a better thing. It's an improvement. You know? when a white cat turns black, it's a problem. <laughs> I'm not saying anything about the quality. I'm just saying it's... Uh, <laughs> All right. You know, color, it might be better, you know, we understand where you're going. <laughs> there's CCNAs and there's CCNRs. <laughs> yeah, so what are the differences with a system like this from the others? The biggest thing is because people are looking out for their own on this system, if somebody is doing something that is questionable, this system is self-policing. Um, if somebody is acting in a way that might bring the services under attack, the other people who don't want to lose their email and their web services will say, cut the shit, because if you don't, I'm going to kick your ass, because I'm not going to be able to get my email. So I don't need to be a personal enforcer on all this, because everybody else does it for me. <laughs> it's pretty nice. Um, with the hack attempts, uh, people aren't good at what they try to do. They're like, I'm going to scan you to see if I can you know, hit you with some Microsoft IIS vulnerability. And that's kind of funny because I'm running OpenBSD on a non-x86 machine, but people still are probing port 139 and trying to do weird stuff. Um, but if there is a problem, then if somebody brings something to my attention, or even if it's not a critical security measure, uh, they just need something done, they just come right to me and it gets done. Uh, in a system that's this small, this is feasible. Um, in this case, a benevolent dictatorship works better than a democracy um, because I still have the time and the effort and the resources to actually handle the problems. If it was 10 times the size, there's no way this would work. But it's still small enough that direct management works and for now, that's just how it's going to be. Uh, people are also very helpful. Um, if somebody wants something installed, for example, um, my basic response is, I'll do it if I have time. If you can do all of the prep work for me so that I just have to run a few commands, it'll be a lot more likely to happen. So the users who want a service will do the work for me because they want the service for themselves. So they're doing the work for themselves and they just need a final you know, ratification of this service change by me. And in this case, again, it's small enough that this works, and I trust my users enough that this works. And that's another point that I'll bring up in a second about trusting your users. Uh, the misuse of resources, nobody is going to do that because nobody wants to have their access pulled. Uh, I've only had to pull one person's access permanently, and 
they just didn't get it. But everybody else has realized, if I do something stupid on your system, I will have my account pulled. So I'm not going to do something stupid. It works. It's not the best system. It's not the most automated system in the world, but it works. Um, and as for hardware failure, people were actually, because of their involvement in the project, even if only as a user, if something died, people would offer up money and hardware in order to fix it. Um, again, this is it's still operating under the benevolent dictator model, uh, but users are still involved. They still make up the system. They are the reason the system exists. And so if they realize if we do something, then we will get more back, it's worth it. If you make your users feel like this is actually a valuable exchange, that they are getting something back for their time, for their effort, for their money, they will contribute. And when you're this small, this is really the best way of going about doing it. You don't need to be rich. You don't need to have tons and tons of time. Just provide something that works and tell your users, if you give me something good, you will, you will maximize your ROI, minimize your TCO, et cetera, et cetera. But it works. It does work. And it's a different kind of community. Uh, it's basically invite only. I will not give an account on the system to somebody I don't know and don't at least marginally trust. Uh, this often makes me look like an asshole, and that's OK. Mm -hmm. uh, you should not feel you guilty. Look like a racist or a whore. Yeah, as long as I don't look like a racist or a whore. Actually, <laughs> whore's OK. I mean, Wait, you. Wait, you. You're making money, so it's not so bad. Uh, they're dicks, they're pussies, and they're assholes. <laughs> uh, making something invite only, it does breed an air of elitism. And this is something you need to watch out for. And you need to make it very clear. I'm not doing this because I like to be a dick and I like to exclude people. You're doing this because you want to say, I need to make sure that I can let this community self maintain itself. And if somebody understands that, then usually they go, oh, OK, that, that's cool. And if they don't, they just get pissed off at you, and you never wanted them anyways. Uh, usually when somebody would ask me for an account, and I would have no idea who they are, my response would be, well, why don't you introduce yourself to me? Buy me a beer, talk to me for a bit, and get to know me. And if I think you're not a shitbag, then I'll probably give you an account. And some people are like, oh, OK, cool, and then do that, and they get accounts. Some people would be like, oh, I can't believe you're such a jerk, and not talk to me again, and I'm OK with that. So. <laughs> There is nothing bad about maintaining a reasonable bar for entry as long as you're not as long as you're not using it to specifically exclude individuals and you're using it actually for the greater good as opposed to uh, boosting your own ego and trying to breed elitism. It works. You have to fight those statements of this guy's being a jerk, but it does work. And the benefit for doing this is that your users do your work for you. They contribute. They self-monitor. They self-regulate. And wash dishes. Um, they, they do. <laughs> they never, they never wash dishes. I, that, that's true. <laughs> Some, well, uh, so what you're doing is you are basically putting in a reasonable admission system in exchange for having people feel uh, welcomed and comfortable, and feeling like if they do give back, they are contributing to a community. You're building a community as opposed to running a project for your own personal gain. If, if people think that you're just doing it for the fame, for your ego, for the ability to exclude people you don't like just because you don't like them, <laughs> uh, if you do all of that, Getting then. Free. Yeah. No. <laughs> I give them money. So if. <laughs> If, <laughs> anyways, um, no, if, if you do all these things, then your users will actually feel like it is something worth giving back to, and everybody wins. Uh, you build a community, that is the goal, to build a community as opposed to build a uh, ego-based system where you get to be king, like King Openfly over there. Yeah. Uh, the, it removed my optum after that. Yeah, well, <laughs> the downside is, um, with this kind of system is that the person in charge, uh, whether you're doing it for the ego boost or not, if you don't do your job, people will lose confidence in you, and then you won't have anything. 
you have to do the dirty jobs in order to build the community. And if you're even looking for respect, you actually have to do something in order to get the respect. You have to offer the system, offer the service. It has to be up. It has to be available. Um, if, you're, if you don't do that, then people are just going to call you an asshole and not look up to you. And that often requires a lot of uh, time commitment and, in some cases, a lot of financial commitment. So some final observations. About 10 minutes left. So uh, not all these communities can be invite only. Um, I, it, if you're living with people, then you definitely want to screen who you're living with. Uh, but if it's a network like 2600 net, you can't keep people off the network. Even if you are a network admin and are able to G-line people or whatever, uh, people can just come back through another machine. There's no way of restricting the access uh, to the network. So you have to find an acceptable compromise between closing your doors and opening everything up to everybody no matter what. And a lot of this depends on the situation. If it's something on the internet, then yeah, chances are more people have to be involved. If it's a party in your own home, then you can be a lot more selective about who you let in. Uh, it's just a matter of figuring out, is this good for us? Is it good for them? Which is more important? If it's great to throw a party with hundreds and hundreds of people and thousands of dollars worth of booze, but it destroys where you live, you need to make that decision of, is it more worth it to have a reasonable place to live or to throw a really good party? And that value call there, that judgment, is very different than if you have very little personal involvement, like, oh, I can just throw up a server on a network and be another leaf node for IRC. Very, very different judgment. So the line is different in all these places, but most people can figure out the general area where it is pretty quickly. And then it's just a matter of experimenting, tweaking, customizing it to your situation. Uh, not all communities can be financed by an angel. Um, if you want to build something, you should probably expect to pay for it. Uh, I feel really bad that Froggy loses money on this con, and I hope that this year he doesn't, and I hope that he's even profitable either this year or in the future. Um, but unfortunately, it seems to be the reoccurring theme. If you want to get something off the ground, you've got to bear the weight on your shoulders until it will finally start rising. And some people are not expected to, uh, are not expecting this. They, they just want the fame and the recognition. They say, oh, well, I'm going to throw this event. And then they don't realize, no, this is a serious commitment. You will probably lose money if you do it. And you'll probably lose money for a while until you figure out all these little tweaks you have to make in order to make it float. So I'm really happy that Froggy is continuing on with this you know, third year here and that there are more planned for the future. Uh, he's got the right idea. He's doing things really well. Other projects just, they realize, oh, I have to put in time and money, and just they're gone. They sink, they're dead. So usually, you don't need a lot of money commitment to a project. It really depends on what it is. Very different with a con than putting up an IRC server. But the time commitment is another big thing. If you're not willing to be a part of a project, don't do it. Don't do it because you think it's neat. Pass it along to somebody else who's willing to do it and support them. But it works out better for everybody involved that way. And beware of people who only offer their contributions when it's fashionable. You know, If something is on its way up, if it looks good to do it, then it's great to offer your help. You know, it's, you know, you're, you're not coming in on the ground floor. Um, if you can do it later on, then hey, oh yeah, I've, I've been involved with that. Yeah, that's, that's great. I'd love to, to be a part of that. These people aren't really going to offer help where it's needed or when it's needed. So beware of these people, because nobody wants to do the shit work. And you're only going to do the shit work if it's in the situation where if you don't do it, nobody else does. And those are the people who really pull the projects through. One person pulling out of a project can cause a cascading failure. Um, I will not mention any projects in particular, but there's been a recent case for this. And in a couple of months, we will see whether this cascading failure actually completely cripples the project or not. I think it will. Um, but one person can break the confidence of others involved. And if nobody has the confidence, nobody wants to put in the time and the effort, 
then your whole project is doomed before it starts. So make sure there's communication, make sure people are happy, and make sure people are doing it because they want to be doing it and they find it enjoyable. Um, if they don't, then you're out of luck. So uh, these are the three projects that I highlighted here. I don't have time to really talk about the other, which is OK, because we haven't really done much work on it. Uh, with a friend of mine, uh, I just recently moved to Holyoke, Massachusetts. Uh, it's the first planned industrial city in America. It used to be uh, it almost completely made with uh, paper mills around these three canals. And now, because the paper industry is gone, it's this run-down shell of a city. And what that means is property is dirt cheap, and the ability to get involved with anything you want, whether urban revitalization from buying a place to squatting in a place to getting on city council, it's all open. And I'm being, getting involved. I'm getting involved with a friend of mine. I just recently bought a house in this city, and we're in the process of taking over a block in downtown city, evicting people who don't pay their rent or don't have leases or won't leave after their notice to quit. Not that I'm bitter or anything, but. Oh. Yeah, I'm not going to be a slum ward. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so be because of these issues, you know, evicting people who shouldn't be there, uh, the project has been delayed by a few months so far and is still in the process of being delayed. Um, <sighs> anyways, um, we, are, we are in the process of effectively taking over a city block in downtown Holyoke and turning it around and uh, turning it into the kind of space where we can have events, not necessarily hacker themed, uh, but definitely those people are involved, are interested, and can use the space. So uh, that's what we're working on. That's the unnamed project if you read the synopsis of the talk and you were wondering. So in two years, we're going to go to the How the City Block in Holyoke fail? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll show, I'll show pictures of the, uh, the tenants, like, smoking crack. Yeah. Awesome. You, you, you don't even need to go to the talk. You can read the article on Wikipedia. Um, so that's, that's really it. Um, oh, a few more things. Yeah. Goddamn right they will. Uh, the other things, respect breeds respect. If you show respect for your users, then they'll sometimes show respect for you. Uh, and if you're trying to build a community, you need these people involved. They are the community. It's not you. It's everybody involved. So you can't hate the people you're trying to build a community with. It just doesn't work. <laughs> and if you don't do anything when you're in a position of leadership, other people will try to get away with as much as they can. They will deliberately push you to see where the line is. They'll try to push the line back. And it, it's a game to some people, like that guy right there. <laughs> and, and the bottom line is success, successful projects are hard work, and it takes time. Nothing comes overnight. And you need to do these hard jobs before you can celebrate your success. Uh, if you don't put in the effort, you won't get the results. So respect your users and actually do the work, and maybe you can build something. It, it's, worked for me in varying degrees of success. Uh, I still open up 2600 Magazine, see my name in the front cover, and kind of cry. So um, I still hope that the, uh, the IRC network will get better. Um, it's a very slow process, but we'll see. Um, I'm doing everything I can. Other projects like Oculi work really well. So uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And the, the, the question is, is it worth it? If it is, do it. If it's not, don't. Um, if, you, if it's not worth it to you and you're not willing to put in the time and the effort, then it's only going to come around and bite you in the ass in the end. So if it's worth it, do it. Don't give it up. It'll, it'll work. So that's it. <laughs> Are there any questions? Any at all? Yes? Why do you hate the hacker halfway half so much? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's a prerequisite to hate ex-girlfriends. Oh. Um, oh. oh. I thought so too. Um, uh, also, you know, 
<laughs> Brooklyn, it's a dirty place. Why would you want to go there? Whoa, 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 whoa. Dirty like your mom. Yeah, not like, not like Holyoke, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's not white enough for you? Hey, Holyoke is more than 50% Puerto like Rican. <laughs> <laughs> no. We gotta stop all this CCNA on CCNA hate. Man. Yeah, it's it's true. Are there any other questions? Yes. Is this why I give you a free presenter pass to do this bullshit? <laughs> <laughs> Shit! I've been caught. <laughs> all right, I've been busted. All right. Yeah. Put some stickers up. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Any legitimate questions that don't make me look bad in front of an audience? <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, other things. Uh, there's another party in 522 starting whenever until we get shut down by security. Oh, 524? <laughs> Network group for Hope. I hear it's organization is super optimized.